Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Before School Podcast, episode four. Today we have a great guest, Rupert Sheldrake. He is an author of many books and papers, 90 scientific papers and nine books to be exact. He is best known for his hypothesis on morphic resonance. And I discovered him through his TED talk back in 2013, which was banned controversially by TED, but ironically gave it a lot of attention. And uh, his work focuses on non-physical phenomena, scientific dogmas, and challenging materialistic scientific worldviews. So without further ado, let's dive in. Good. Um, Hi, Rupert. Good. Thanks for, thanks for joining. Great to see you again. Yes, good. And you're, um, the, the, um, that animation is doing incredibly well. I'm, well, most of your things do well, but by my standards, it's fantastic. Yes, that one's doing particularly well. I think there's something about exposing dogmas that people, it brings about curiosity. Yeah. Well, it's, it's had, I mean, last time I looked, it had about a million views. So, I mean, that's, uh, some of yours are well over a million, but um, obviously your channel's incredibly successful in attracting people's attention and it really works. And so are your ideas. Well, the combination is, is I've had a lot of very positive feedback about it. So um, anyway, I'm very pleased you did it. It's really got the message out much more widely than it would have been and probably to a younger audience as well. Wow. Well, thank you for that. And and thank you for letting me use that audio. I think mm. it's, it's kind of ironic that the act of Ted banning that really added fuel to that fire and, and made people interested in it, right? Absolutely. And the fact that you carried on with the original audio rather than re-recording, I thought it was very unlikely Ted would try coming after you again, because, uh, you know, if they would tried banning it a second time, it would have gone so viral. It would have been like pouring gas on the flames. Uh, it would have been, um, I think that even if it came to the attention of their management, they would have decided not to. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was smart to, to leave it alone. Well, yeah. um, I just started a new podcast, so this is kind of a new venture and, uh, I'm very honored to have you on as a guest. And I would love it if we could start by maybe just briefly explaining the idea of morphic resonance. Morphic resonance is the idea of memory in nature, the idea that there's a kind of memory inherent in the whole universe, in everything in nature. Um, the so-called laws of nature are more like habits from this point of view. And each species has a kind of collective memory, a bit like what the psychologist Jung called the collective unconscious. So if you take um, a, a, an animal, say a rabbit, then um, the as the embryo develops, it would have a kind of memory bimorphic resonance of previous rabbit embryos. And, and when it's uh, born, it would tune in to previous rabbits and inherit rabbit instincts. So what I'm suggesting is a lot of biological inheritance, particularly of form and of instincts, is happening mainly by morphic resonance. The genes play a part because they enable organisms to make the right proteins. Epigenetics play a part. They enable them to adapt to the environment. But I think much of it depends on morphic resonance. Um, so this collective memory is an important part of many animal groups, including human groups. So that's, in a nutshell, the idea. And although uh, the idea of memory in nature is very unfamiliar uh, to people in the Western world, it's completely standard in the Eastern world, in Hindu and Buddhist philosophy, uh, the idea of a kind of memory in nature is taken for granted. And I had the strange experience of thinking of morphic resonance when I was working at Cambridge, when people found it really surprising and uh, even shocking. And then I was working in India after that. I had lived in India for seven years. And when I talked about it to my Indian colleagues, their reaction was, oh, there is nothing new in this idea. The ancient philosophers have been saying this for thousands of years, and so on. So um, anyway, in the Western context, it's a new idea. 
and it's based on similarity resonance because everything's made of vibratory patterns of activity and subsequent similar patterns vibrate with previous patterns that have a similar uh, that are similar that's the idea across time wow thank you for that explanation and it, it definitely seems to resonate with a lot of people you know there's these ideas of the collective conscious and ancestral memory what other aspects outside of like you, you've talked about telepathy and how does that play a part in all this well, telepathy is something I also investigated. I mean, I, I go in for controversial areas of science. I mean, morphic resonance is controversial, and of course, telepathy is as well. Um, a lot of scientists would like to believe it's impossible because they believe the mind is nothing but the brain and the activity of the brain inside the head. Um, and therefore, telepathy, your thoughts or intentions influencing someone at a distance, ought not to be possible. And yet it is. Um, and how it relates to my ideas on morphic resonance is that morphic resonance is takes place within morphic fields, which are shaped formative fields. Um, an embryo is shaped by formative fields, which are called morphogenetic fields, form shaping fields. Um, and thoughts are shaped by morphic fields, which organize the activity of the brain. And social groups are also shaped by morphic fields, which give the group its shape, form and coherence, like flocks of birds, like those flocks of starlings that can all turn together and bank and move around without bumping into each other, and schools of fish. So I think there are fields for social groups. and. Humans have social groups, of course, families, football teams, societies, choirs, there's lots of different kinds of social group. Um, and animals, of course, have them all social animals by definition have social groups. So a pack of wolves, for example, um, uh, when they're together, they're bonded in this group. But what I'm suggesting is that the social bonds stretch when some of the wolves go hunting to get food for the young in the den, for example, um, the bonds are not broken, they still remain connected at a distance. And those social bonds uh, uh, work through morphic fields and provide a kind of communication at a distance. And that I think is the basis of telepathy. And telepathy typically happens between bonded members of social groups. It doesn't happen much with strangers. Um, nearly all the sort of everyday cases of telepathy, thinking of someone who then calls on the telephone and you say, it's funny, I was just thinking about you. That's an example of telephone telepathy. Um, that mostly happens with close friends, family members, identical twins, um, very close colleagues. Uh, people with whom there's a social or an emotional bond. It doesn't happen with random strangers, uh, cold calling salespeople and so on. Um, and the same is true of social bonds with animals. Um, when we adopt dogs or cats and have them in our homes as part of our family, um, then they form social bonds with us and they're often very telepathic with their owners. I've done a lot of research on animal human telepathy. Um, I wrote a book called Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home. Um, uh, because a lot of dogs know when their owners are coming home by going and waiting at a door or window, and they show that they know. Um, cats do the same. Um, not quite such a high proportion of cats does it. So other animals do it too. But the main ones I've studied are dogs. And some people say, well, dogs, of course, they know when the owner's coming home because it's a routine or they hear the car sounds coming down the street and so on. That may be true in some cases, but we've studied cases where the dogs respond to non-routine times of return. And we do experiments where we film the place the dog waits the whole time the owner is out. Um, so we have a complete record of when they go to the door or window. And we have the owners come home at randomly chosen times that they don't know in advance. We call them on a mobile phone and tell them when to go home. They have no warning. 
and they don't know in advance and no one at home knows when they're coming if there is anyone at home in some of the experiments there's no one there so um, then we to rule out the familiar car sound theory we have them come in unfamiliar cars or taxis a different taxi each time um, and the dogs still go on doing this over and over again and I published papers on this with my colleague Pam Smart in peer-reviewed journals and there's a video online that shows one of these experiments so um, this is is something that millions of dog owners experience on a daily basis so we're not talking about something that's extraordinary we're talking about something that's ordinary it's not paranormal it's normal um, it's not supernatural it's natural uh, so I think that telepathy is a manifestation of the bonds between bonded animals or people within a social morphic field. Wow. Yeah, I, I totally relate to what you're saying. And I think a lot of people who have pets have this connection with them. Yet it seems like mainstream established science dismisses things like this as, uh, you know, like woo. And well, I was wondering, you know, the ideas that you put forward seem to resonate with so many millions of people. But there seems to also be this like resistance from the establishment. Why do you think that materialist science is so resistant to these ideas? Well, precisely because it's materialist. Um, materialism is the philosophy that the only reality in the universe is matter or physicalism is similar to materialism, but it, of course, expands matter to include fields and energy. Anyway, physicalism or materialism are used interchangeably, basically saying the universe is made up of physical stuff, uh, which is unconscious, and it has no purpose, no meaning. Uh, evolution, cosmic evolution, biological evolution has no purpose or direction. And the entire universe is unconscious, governed by mathematical laws, which have no purpose in themselves. Um, and by chance events, which of course have no purpose. So this is the standard materialist philosophy that's implicit in all science courses and became the orthodoxy of science in the late 19th century. Um, and most scientists don't think about it. In fact, they don't even know it's a philosophy. They think it's just the truth or the scientific worldview. But actually, it's a very distinct philosophy um, that's based on a whole set of assumptions. And in my book, um, Science Set Free, which is called The Science Delusion in the UK, um, is uh, I deal with the 10 main dogmas of materialism and show how we've gone beyond them. And indeed, I summarize that in your excellent animation, your after school animation of my uh, Ted X talk on the science delusion. So given that materialists believe that matter is unconscious um, and that the whole universe is only made of matter, um, they have a really big problem when it comes to the fact that we're conscious. We ought not to be if the whole universe is made of only unconscious matter and there's nothing else. Um, we ought not to be conscious. So some materialist philosophers pretend that we're not, but they're not very convincing, of course, because they're trying to persuade people they're right through conscious arguments and, and you know, to say, uh, you know, to try and prove you're not conscious and that the person listening to you isn't conscious is a hard sell. So other materialists uh, have given up on trying to persuade people consciousness doesn't exist. And they've adopted a different view. They say it's an illusion produced inside the brain. The problem is that doesn't solve it either because illusion is itself a mode of consciousness. Um, so you presuppose consciousness if you say it's an illusion. Um, and so that's why the very existence of consciousness is called the hard problem in the philosophy of mind. We ought not to be conscious and yet we are. Um, so um, at any rate, although consciousness isn't explained by materialist science, in fact, most of the 20th century materialist psychologists, the behaviorist school, denied consciousness existed. And the only thing they'd study was 
muscular movements or glandular secretions which were objectively observable. Uh, so it's not as if materialism has a very good track record in explaining consciousness. At most, it tries to explain it away. Um, but nevertheless, it's based on the idea it's all inside the brain. Uh, it must be inside the brain, because where else could it be? It's produced by the nervous system somehow in an unexplained way. Therefore, if you think of me and you want to call me on the phone and we know each other well and I'm used to picking up your thoughts or intentions and I pick up your thoughts and start thinking Mark and, and, and start thinking about you, then the phone rings and I answer it and it's you and I say it's amazing I was just thinking about you. That's a kind of telepathic phenomenon that ought not to happen if all your thoughts or intentions are inside your skull. And if all my thoughts and intentions are carefully insulated and isolated inside my head, which is the official view. Therefore, since from that point of view, telepathy is impossible, anyone who says it exists is either stupid, foolish, superstitious, or if they claim, as I do, that there's scientific evidence, then the evidence must be flawed, either because the experiments haven't been done well enough or because I'm a fraud. Um, so those are the options available to skeptics, and they use all of them. Um, they, they prefer to say the experiments are flawed, or sometimes they say there's no evidence whatsoever. Uh, but they never look at it. In fact, um, the, the present stance of leading so-called skeptics, uh, like Steven Pinker, is to say you don't need to look at it because we know it's impossible, so why waste time looking at evidence for something we know can't exist? So the resistance among conventional materialist scientists is really ideological or dogmatic. It's not based on careful examination of the facts or the evidence. Most of the materialists I've had arguments with uh, have simply not looked at the evidence. They're, they're not interested in it because they think it must be meaningless. Um, so we're dealing here not with a position that's genuinely scientific, a scientific position is to look at evidence, to be open-minded, to inquire, to do experiments, and so on. We're looking at a position that's a kind of scientific fundamentalism or dogmatism. And normally, uh, most of my scientific colleagues are able to put people down. If somebody says, well, my dog does it, then they'll say, oh, well, you just, it's just coincidence. You're only remembering the times it does it, and you forget all the times it doesn't. They say that kind of thing and put people down. Uh, the trouble is that they can't easily put me down because I've got the right kind of credentials and I know that language and I've been through that whole sort of scientific process of PhD and research at Cambridge and so forth, publishing over 100 papers in peer-reviewed journals. So, you know, I know that world and so I refuse to be put down um, and keep coming up with evidence and the result is they just get really angry. Um, and that's one reason my TED talk was banned, because they couldn't bear the idea of me having a public platform for ideas they think are impossible. So it's a kind of dogmatic intolerance, and it's confined to the academic world largely, but a lot of educated people who've been to university have partially absorbed it and know that they ought not to believe in things like telepathy, but as soon as they get home, their dog's waiting for them at the door. They do believe in it because they experience it or when they know who's calling on the phone and it turns out to be right over and over again of course they believe in it and most people who haven't been to university and don't feel they need to pretend to be super scientific just take it for granted and that's true all over the world i mean when i lived in india the vast majority of indians including very educated indians just take these things completely for granted. They, they can't see why there's a dispute about them. Um, so we're in a very peculiar position where uh, there are phenomena like telephone telepathy that 85% of the population have experienced. Dogs that know when their owners are coming home, about 50% of dogs do it. Uh, common phenomena that are happening on a daily basis to hundreds of millions, if not billions of people worldwide. Uh, which they take for granted on the basis of experience, good scientific evidence that these things are real, and yet a culture of denialism uh, within 
mainstream scientific institutions and among the editors of Wikipedia who've captured all the pages that deal with these phenomena on Wikipedia. So it's a really bizarre thing of something that's widespread, common, scientifically supported by evidence on the one hand and a kind of denialism on the other which has managed to capture the intellectual high ground and and portray this as a kind of intellectually respectable position in fact the only intellectually respectable position that's the problem uh, i i confront all the time in my work on these phenomena and there's no obvious way forward because if people won't look at the evidence then producing more evidence isn't going to convince them. Personal experience is what will convince them probably. And, and most of them do have these experiences, but they then another part of themselves denies their own experience. Right. Well, I think what you're doing is so critically important because we need respectable scientists to have the courage to step forward and, and actually explore these difficult topics. You know, some of the, and maybe that's where the fear comes from because you work so hard to, to get to a certain place in your career. And if you step out of line, you could risk everything. You could lose all your funding. You could lose your title, your position, your status, your reputation. And so maybe that is part of the thing that keeps people in line and keeps them conforming. You know, these academic institutions are massive and the bigger an organization is, the more somebody kind of like falls in line. And uh, I wrote down a quote before this podcast that when I read this quote, I think of your talk. It's from Arthur Schopenhauer. He says, all truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. So I think... You're kind of maybe in phase two, slightly going into phase three. Are people starting to accept this now? Well, the thing is that the vast majority of people accept it anyway because they've experienced it. So if we're talking about the population as a whole in Western Europe and North America, um, most people accept it because they've experienced it. Once you get into the scientific world, the answer is a bit more complicated because um, I've often given talks about this research within scientific institutions. And um, what happens is usually quite interesting in the reception after the talk, you know, in, here in Britain, it's usually tea. Um, in America, it's usually coffee. But during the reception after the talk, um, people come up to me, people who've been at the talk who haven't said anything at that stage, and, and they look to make sure nobody's listening. And then they say, you know, what you said was really interesting. I often have this experience with telephone telephone through with my wife or my partner, um, you know, and I, my dog knows when I'm coming home from the lab. And, you know, I've had a lot of things like this. I've had precognitive dreams as well. I'm sure these things are real and stuff. But I can't talk to my colleagues about it because they're all so straight. So then uh, this is very predictable. You know, a few minutes later, another person comes up to me and they look both ways and they say more, more or less the same thing. And in most scientific institutions, if the reception goes on long enough, I have five, ten people who've told me the same thing. So sometimes I say to them, you know, you know, I know there are uh, at least six or seven other people in your scientific department that think like this and have had similar experiences. They say, oh, no, there aren't. They say so straight. Well, I say, I know they are because they've just told me. And, and sometimes I point them out and I say, why don't you guys get together? And, you know, you, and in one place, I, the, everyone, all, this, all the research staff, every one of them, including the professor, um, said the same to me and, and in, individually. And in that case, I said to them, you know, why don't you guys come out? Because you'd have so much more fun. Um, and so I think science is full of uh, people who've actually had these experiences, who do believe in them, but would never like to say that at work when they think their colleagues might overhear them or know what they think. 
So it's a bit like gays in the 1950s. You know, there were lots of gay people pretending to be straight in the 1950s, and sometimes they'd work in the same institution, they'd pretend to be straight to other people who are actually gays pretending to be straight. But when gays came out of the closet, um, they found that they could talk freely to other people who are gay and life became much more relaxed. And so I think if scientists who've had these experiences come out of the closet with their colleagues, they'll find a lot of colleagues actually agree with them. And this will make it easier to overthrow what has become a dogmatic orthodoxy that may have made sense in the late 19th century, but has now been completely superseded by the advances of science itself. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that people are going to start coming out and hopefully we'll have a, a blossoming of people daring to explore these ideas. So what I've noticed lately is that there's a lot of similarities between like mainstream science and a religion. Is this kind of, you know, it's gone to great lengths to distance itself from religion, but is it inadvertently becoming another religion? Well, I think so. I mean, I think that materialism um, is very closely linked to atheism. I mean, if you have a universe with no consciousness in it and nothing beyond it, then you've basically got an atheistic universe. And most materialists are atheists. Some of them are militant evangelical atheists who want to convert everyone else to atheism. Um, so um, that's very similar to uh, it's very like a kind of evangelical Protestantism. It's much more like evangelical Protestantism than it is like Catholicism, um, you know, with this kind of zeal to convince people and, and um, these militant skeptic organizations. So I think it is, it's like a kind of scientific fundamentalism. Um, and it's like a religion in the sense that people's identities uh, the, for, for true believers in this world view, their whole identity and sense of self-worth and value depends on this world view. Uh, so it becomes an important part of their personality, which is why questioning it often produces these emotional reactions. It's based on fear and insecurity and, and you know, people feel that their most valued beliefs are being trespassed on. Um, so it, it of course, it doesn't. It also, all religions offer some benefits, and I suppose the benefit this offers to people is not immediately obvious because telling people that they live in a world that has no purpose, their minds nothing but their brain, it all goes blank when you die, um, that there's uh, nothing really out there, no angels, no saints, no gods, no goddesses, nothing out there to help them. They're on their own. Uh, they're isolated inside the privacy of their skull. Their mind is cut off from everybody else, completely separate. This is actually rather a depressing worldview uh, because depression comes from alienation and separation. And uh, this is a worldview that tells you, hey, that's the way it is. Um, so I think it's not surprising that depression is the endemic mental disorder of advanced industrial societies, which are dominated by the materialist ideology. So it doesn't have much to offer in terms of um, cheering people up or making their lives seem meaningful. The one thing it does have to offer is make people think they're smarter than everyone else. Um, uh, materialists uh, and atheists usually think they're smarter than everyone else. Everyone else goes on believing stuff that they've been indoctrinated to believe by parents or family or grandparents or, or priests or, or whatever. They've all been brainwashed and indoctrinated to these superstitions. But the atheist materialist has risen above all that, seen through it, uh, rejected it as childish superstitious stuff that's unreasonable and not based on science and reason and has marched out into light of science and reason with scientists and the vanguard of progress. Now that's the kind of self-image and that um, is, of course, there are advantages. I'm a scientist myself, I'm all in favour of science and reason. I'm not against science and reason at all. But what I'm against is um, 
a dogmatic belief system that is actually unscientific and unreasonable, uh, posing as scientific and reasonable. Um, so I think that the um, it has become a kind of a kind of religious belief system for a lot of people. I mean, the hardcore of committed believers, the people who support these skeptic organizations and atheist organizations um, are a minority within science. It's, most scientists aren't like that. Recent surveys have shown that the kind of hardcore atheist materialist believers are about 25% of the scientific community in Britain, uh, France and Germany. Um, about nearly 50% are religious or spiritual, but not religious. So, and about 20% are agnostic. So about 45% describe themselves as non-religious, about the same proportion describe themselves as spiritual or religious or both. Um, so they're a minority, but they're a very vociferous minority. And not everyone who's an atheist is a militant atheist. There are plenty of atheists who so, you know, I don't believe in God myself, but, you know, it's great if other people want to believe in it, fine by me, sort of thing. Um, or they sometimes say, modest atheists say, you know, I don't believe in God because I think this is beyond anything we can conceive, so we can't really know one way or the other. And that would be a kind of modest atheism. But uh, the, the, the people who are best known in the public domain as campaigners for against psychic phenomena and people like Richard Dawkins are militant atheists um, who really are trying to convert people to their point of view as with a kind of evangelical campaign. Well, it's interesting that we, everybody has beliefs, even the most hardcore atheist believes in something. And we don't get our beliefs from facts we get we get them from narratives so if you have a very strong narrative you'll incorporate anything that reaffirms that narrative and you'll discard anything that goes against it and maybe that's why you saying the things you are in the face of all these dogmas it got so much resistance because it flies in the face of this very strong narrative that in ways has helped us develop these very comfortable lives it's given us you know that materialist hardcore worldview has given us medicine and convenience and it's built up this huge civilization and it's kind of interesting now because we've put nature in a box and we we've we have it under control but and most of our problems now like you were saying it's depression it's a spiritual crisis and we're still in this materialist thinking where we're trying to fix a spiritual crisis with a materialistic remedy you know we're, we think of if somebody's sad oh it's because of, because of a chemical imbalance in their brain and, or we don't look at it as maybe they just need to address the source of this maybe it's a a crisis of the soul so i think that's why these psychedelic therapies for depression are so interesting because the the whole point of you know there's a lot of research now shows that people who are uh, chronically addicted or chronically depressed can be helped through taking psychedelics and under control uh, conditions with counseling and support. I mean, I'm not none of these studies is not like putting LSD in the drinking water or anything like that. It's you no, know, these are controlled studies um, where people take one or two doses of something like psilocybin the active principle of magic mushrooms. Um, and what's interesting there is that they're very successful, much more successful than regular antidepressants um, in relieving depression. And it's not just the chemical that's doing it. It's the experience that the chemical leads to, which is for many people a kind of mystical experience that gives them a sense that their consciousness is part of something much greater than themselves. Um, and that's really the basis of all mystical experiences, the sense that you're part of something greater than yourself. And that mystical insight or, or, or flash or experience that comes uh, to people often leads to a reorientation of their whole life, a, a sense of greater meaning or purpose, largely because 
they've had a kind of spiritual opening. It opens a spiritual window in otherwise what was a kind of closed world. Um, and so I think it's fascinating that the um, that this, these therapies are working precisely because they're having these effects on people's consciousness. They're not working primarily at the level of chemistry. I mean, the chemistry is necessary for these conscious changes as a result of the psychedelic, but it's not like <clears throat> a, a pill that just fixes something by changing a, a cell chemically. It's it, the experience is part of the cure. Yeah, well, the problem is, how do you make money off of this? Right? Well, there's plenty of people trying to figure that out. I mean, of course, you can't make money off of people picking up wild magic mushrooms. They grow all over the place here in Europe. I don't know about the wild ones in North America. I mean, I live here, so I'm more, more familiar with the ones in England. But um, they, they grow wild and they're plentiful. They, of course, they're, it's a limited time period, but some people dry them, so they've got a year-round supply. So they're basically free. But there are um, companies that have got now billions of dollars in investment for psychedelic companies that want to monetize them by patenting uh, preparation methods for psilocybin or for setting up paid for retreat centers where you'd go on a retreat and take psychedelics. I mean, I think that's quite a good idea. Doing it in a retreat setting with with expert guidance is is a probably a better way than certainly a better way than, of doing it than at a kind of random party where there are drunken people all over the place and you you feel might feel quite insecure so um so i think a retreat model there's no reason why that shouldn't be profit making but um it, it's the hope of profit that has in fact lured investors to invest in this area and that's not altogether bad because some of this research is being funded by investors who want evidence for psychedelics being useful for curing addiction or depression or other mental conditions. Um, and the funding might not have been there otherwise. So, you know, everything has its uses. Do you have any concerns about the commercialization of these mystical experiences? Well, I mean, obviously, if people manage to put mystical experiences in a bottle and, and then charge high prices for them and stuff, then one might feel this was sort of exploitative. But um, I think what we really need here is diversity. I think that you know it's probably better for people who take psychedelics to do it with someone to guide them if they're not familiar with the experience. And there are private psychedelic counselors, there are retreat centers, legal now in, in some parts of the world, where you can do a legal ayahuasca retreat in Peru, for example, or um, legal mushroom retreat in the Netherlands. Um, that's one way. I think one of the interesting areas is the um, growth of uh, psychedelic religions. As you probably know, in Brazil, there's a, there are several psychedelic churches. One is called Santo Daime. And Santo Daime takes, it's a Christian church that takes um, ayahuasca as a kind of communion. Um, and there it's part of a ceremony done with other people in a kind of ritual setting and, and so on. And again, that's, that's not primarily about making money. It's not a commercial company. It's a religious group. And so I think <coughs> as these substances become legalized, as they are doing, being in certain parts of the United States, or at least decriminalized, then there's the capacity not just for private enterprise people to charge a lot of money for a luxury psilocybin retreat weekend at a spa, um, but also for um, religious groups to develop psychedelic retreats with uh, which are not for profit, but which are within the context of a larger spiritual framework. And I think that's already happening. You know, talking about psychedelics, 
makes me think about what we were talking about earlier about consciousness kind of being outside the brain. And it's interesting how when people do psychedelics, they often report similar experiences. And could, could this be proof that instead of consciousness being generated in the brain, it's something that we kind of tap into. And maybe when we do psychedelics, we're kind of changing the channel. Well, I see it that way. But um, the, the thing is that, in a sense, all mystical experiences, which lie at the root of all religion, I mean, all religions start from mystical experiences, the experience of human consciousness being part of a much greater consciousness. And the Buddha, in his enlightenment, spent years meditating under trees, and his enlightenment under the bow tree, a kind of fig tree, um, where he broke through to a, a state realizing that there's this state of consciousness completely beyond our normal everyday ones. And he found a way of going there and to, through Buddhist monks have ways of training each other to do this. And there are all sorts of meditation practices now where you can do this through meditation. And Christianity, Jesus' first realization that he had this very close connection with with God it came at the moment of his baptism and and I think that um, baptism as practiced by Saint John the Baptist by total immersion um, was actually inducing a kind of near-death experience through drowning and we know that near-death experiences which many people have had as a result of accidents or in operations in hospitals uh, involve feeling yourself going out of your body, often seeing yourself from outside, and then going into a realm where you feel you're part of some conscious realm of consciousness and joy, which is so much greater than your normal self. Then, of course, you come back because it's a near-death experience. Now, Jesus obviously had some experience of that kind, um, and it, he then went on a 40-day vision quest in the wilderness, fasting. Um, and so his teachings came out of a direct mystical connection. They didn't come out of spending years at a rabbinical seminary and getting a PhD. Um, they came out of direct experience. And in all religions, all through the ages, there have been mystics, in Sufis within Islam, you know, Hindu rishis and seers, uh, Christian mystics, um, like the great mystics of the Middle Ages, um, you know, Meister Eckhart, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Julian of Norwich, and so on. I mean, many of these great mystics, and Jewish mystics, um, that in all religions there have been mystics, and mystics are people who cultivate this direct experience, or sometimes it comes spontaneously. Um, and I think many people who are regular practitioners of religions, and many people who are spiritual but not religious, have mystical openings in nature through psychedelics through spiritual practices of one kind or another um, in fact i wrote two books about this the most recent one ways to go beyond and why they work is about seven different spiritual practices which are, have all been studied scientifically with scientifically measurable effects generally speaking highly beneficial effects so i think that the this um the mystical experience which can come through psychedelics is just one kind of mystical experience, one way in which we can get a sense of being part of something greater than ourselves. I would say that the traditional practice of religion through prayer, meditation, ritual, singing and chanting, seasonal festivals, collective celebrations, for many people opens these windows to some degree uh, just as a part of the practice of a normal religion. Um, uh, but mystics obviously spend more time and put a greater emphasis on these direct experiences. But that, I think, is what religion's primarily about. It's about this experience of connection with something greater than ourselves. And that's proof for somebody who accepts their own experience. But if you're a dogmatic materialist or atheist, um, then you have these experiences but instead of accepting them as what they seem to be, namely connection with something greater than yourself, you then have to try and explain them away as some kind of illusion produced inside the brain. 
and a book that came out just a week or two ago um, called Transcendence by someone called Alan Lightman um, is a book by a materialist who has these mystical experiences and yet he tries to uh, explain them away by saying this is just something that brain circuitry has prepared us through evolution for this kind of thing makes us feel good etc it's just an evolutionary emergent mechanism uh, located inside the brain uh, so even though he has these experiences and thinks they're real um, he doesn't think they lead beyond the brain he's trying to reduce them all to changes inside the head so the debate between atheists and people who have mystical experiences is no longer the, the sort of more modern breed of atheists they're not saying these experiences don't happen they're saying these experiences do happen but we can explain them more ultimately we'll be able to explain them as terms in terms of changes inside the head now in my view what's wrong with that position is that it takes an experience and then puts a theory or an ideology as being more superior to it. So if you have the experience of being connected with something greater than yourself, which is the basis of all religion and mysticism and so on, why not accept that as actual direct experience of the way things are, rather than trying to explain it away in terms of a theory that can't really explain consciousness anyway, but just says it's all inside the brain. So there, I think this is so materialists and atheists can remain so trapped in their worldview that even these experiences don't liberate them, at least at first. Now, I suspect that it may get harder and harder if they have these experiences repeatedly to convince themselves it's nothing but their own brain. Um, but, you know, that's, that's an empirical question, a, a, a sociological question. How long can materialists well, Sam Harris is an example. I mean, he's a very well-known example of someone who has mystical experiences. He meditates. Um, he, in one of his podcasts, described what was obviously a very impressive mushroom trip. Uh, but then he says, oh, well, it's all inside the brain. So he's somebody who's on the cusp of this debate. And one reason I think his work's so popular, because in some ways you could see him as a materialist struggling to get out um, but he still hasn't let go of that materialist framework which he needs to fuel his militant atheism so he's he's sort of a, he's a somebody on the cusp really of, of this and i think he'd be happier and so would many of his followers if he felt he didn't any longer have to stay within this ideology that he's still locked within yeah it's funny you, you bring up sam because <clears throat> for a long time i i really looked to sam as a beacon of logic and reason and i even really got into his ideas on there not being any free will um <clears throat> but i didn't i did realize that at a certain point he kind of ran into some contradictions he he has he has a lot of trouble he acknowledges that we are conscious but it's very hard to, to explain how something without free will would even have consciousness, you know? But anyways, uh, that was a really great story that you just went through. And I had a bunch of ideas that went through my mind. But one of the things was when I came to see you out in, in England, and then I went to Egypt right after, was all the amazing cathedrals and historical sites that I saw. And I'm in California. We don't have many of those out here. And just to walk into a cathedral, the energy was so amazing. I couldn't, I couldn't even describe it. It was so it like, it makes you just want to be quiet and admire how, and whoever built those clearly believed in something greater than their, just their lives. You know, they believed in creating something that would go on for thousands of years. And I, I heard you speaking about you were uh, doing these pilgrimages and I found that really fascinating. I would love to learn more about these pilgrimages that you're doing. Well, um, I'm doing one tomorrow as it happens. Um, the, the, what the, the pilgrimages, I'm, I'm a patron of something called the British Pilgrimage Trust, which is 
um, reviving ancient footpath pilgrimage routes in Britain and also uh, developing new ones. So these are all walking pilgrimages through the countryside on foot. Um, so, I mean, there are some pilgrimages where people just take a jet plane and get off at an airport and then take a bus straight to the pilgrimage site. But the much older way of doing pilgrimage is walking to the destination. And this is the way it's traditionally been done all over the world in all religions. Um, so uh, there's a big resurgence of pilgrimage going on here in Europe at the moment. Um, the best known of them all is Santiago de Compostela. Um, and when that was revived in 1987, about a thousand people walked there in, in a year. Uh, 2019, just before the COVID lockdown, it was about 350,000. So you see, there's been a huge growth in walking pilgrimage. And not all the people doing it are devout Roman Catholics. In fact, I, they're probably a minority of those doing it. A lot of them are atheists, agnostics, people on a spiritual quest, people who the idea just appeals to. Um, and so here in Britain, we've been um, opening up long distance routes. One is the old way from Winchester or Southampton to Canterbury which was one of the main pilgrimage centers in the Middle Ages. Chaucer's book, The Canterbury Tales, is stories pilgrims told each other on the way to Canterbury. One of the first books in recognizably modern English. Um, and so that's one, and there are a number of other long distance routes. There's one that's just been established, um, a walking pilgrimage from Wexford in Ireland going to the uh, coast and then a ferry across to Wales and then along the coast of Pembrokeshire to St. David's uh, where there's a great medieval cathedral. Um, we've also uh, opened up a whole lot of one day pilgrimage routes, so just five or six miles to uh, a cathedral or a holy place that you can easily do in a, a day um, and this makes it much more accessible. You don't have to carry kit and sleeping bags and tents and all that kind of thing or um, things you'd need for a longer pilgrimage. Um, and these are proving popular and um, one reason that this is a big deal in, in Britain and in Northern Europe like Scandinavia where there's a big upsurge of pilgrimage there as well, particularly the pilgrimage to Trondheim, the shrine of St. Olaf in the cathedral there. Um, one reason that uh, this is a big deal in, in Northern Europe is because pilgrimage was suppressed at the Reformation in the 16th century. It was outlawed. Uh, the Protestants didn't like pilgrimage and they stopped it and destroyed the shrines and uh, destroyed the infrastructure because the infrastructure for pilgrimage were monasteries. There were monasteries everywhere. and pilgrims could sleep in monasteries and get food in monasteries. So it was like a kind of network of infrastructure for pilgrimage all over Europe. And in Protestant countries, the monasteries were destroyed, the pilgrimage was banned, and the shrines were desecrated, and the places, the, the relics of saints and stuff were destroyed. So that was a huge shift. Um, and in Catholic countries, that didn't happen. Um, and, um, the, and you got the same in, in the Americas, you know, the conquerors of North America, the British and the French and um, in Canada. Well, actually, the French in Canada are Catholic, but the British um, and the colonizing North America were Protestant. And so they saw North America as just real estate you know, to be exploited, developed, owned as private property. And so the whole country is sort of divided up into sort of grid squares of blocks and, and you know, and, and sold off and privatized. Whereas the Spanish and the Portuguese in conquering the Central and Southern America, um, they weren't against holy places or pilgrimage. They had lots of them in Spain and Portugal. They just wanted to make sure they were Christian. So they took over the ancient holy places and Christianized them, like the temple of the Aztec mother goddess, 
near Mexico City for uh, uh, became the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe which has about six million pilgrims a year I mean, it's a massively important pilgrimage site uh, the Black Madonna of Guadalupe in, in Mexico um, so there's a huge difference between the Protestant and Catholic parts of the Americas and in Europe but what's interesting you see is in northern Europe and in, in the Protestant countries this recent revival of pilgrimage means that people are rediscovering these holy places and the power of pilgrimage, uh, whereas the, this was banned and suppressed for so long. I think that one reason that the British invented tourism, which they did in the 18th century, was because the need for pilgrimage was still there and they couldn't call themselves pilgrims anymore, so they called themselves tourists. They still went to the great cathedrals and holy places of the ancient world. Um, but then instead of being able to say a prayer when they got there or make an offering, then they just had to sort of collect souvenirs or now more recently take photographs. So um, I think tourism is best seen as secularized pilgrimage or as a kind of frustrated pilgrimage because people can't actually make the most of it when they get there. Whereas to go as a pilgrim, means you go with an intention. You're not just going there to see the place and take photos. You're going with an intention to give thanks for something or to ask for healing or to ask for something. Um, and so you're walking with an intention or a purpose. And when you get there, then you can say a prayer, make an offering. It's very different from just taking something, taking photos from the place. You're actually giving something to the place through your intention and your respect for it, um, which helps to keep these holy places holy. Um, so I think going as a tourist is much more satisfying. Um, and um, I think what we're seeing at the moment is the beginning of a paradigm shift away from tourism back towards pilgrimage. Um, and I think that's a much healthier attitude to travel with. Yeah, like like we were talking about earlier, depression is is the endemic of this time. And yeah, maybe these pilgrimages and, and trips like this kind of help to fill that hole, that, that emptiness that we've been feeling inside. You know, we, we want to reconnect with our past. Science doesn't explain where we came from or where we're going. And we want to get in touch with that somehow. And usually that's through something more spiritual. Exactly. Um, and it doesn't contradict science. I mean, I'm, you know, I do, do pilgrimages, I have spiritual practices, I'm a scientist, I don't find any conflict. And in fact, as I show in my book, Ways to Go Beyond and Why They Work, and my earlier book, Science and Spiritual Practices, when scientists actually investigate spiritual practices, then you find they have measurable effects in general. People with religious or spiritual practices are happier, healthier, and live longer than those without. And uh, you can study individual practices. I mean, meditation is one of the ones that's been studied most. You know, there's very measurable effects on blood pressure, you know, brain activity, uh, reducing the activity of the default mode network in the brain, which is all about rumination and anxiety and so on. Better sleeping, better less prone to depression. I mean, there's all sorts of uh, studies on meditation, scientific studies, and it's not as if the science and the practice are in conflict at all. It's that the science is studying these spiritual practices and showing that they're actually doing something. Um, so uh, I, there's, there's that standard narrative of conflict between science and religion uh, just melts away when you actually come to look at spiritual practices and, and study them scientifically. The narrative of conflict is really comes out of that ideological story, the story of science triumphing over religion, and like the sort of religions, the baddies that are triumphed by the angels of light, as it were, the scientists in their white coats, sort of 
uh, triumphing over superstition and liberating humanity, etc. I mean, that's and the Inquisition and Galileo, it's all part of the story. Um, as you said earlier, this, the, the many ways the, the sciences have given us huge benefits. I mean, I don't know anyone who'd want to go back to medieval dentistry, for example. Um, uh, so they've given us great benefits. But science doesn't have to be based on a materialist ideology. I mean, a, a more holistic science, which recognizes the reality of consciousness, it, antibiotics will still work. Uh, you know, cell phones will still work, jet planes will still work. You know, it doesn't have to have that ideology. That ideology is, I mean, it works very well when it's all about making machines, which is what modern engineering and technology is about. It doesn't work very well when it comes to anything to do with consciousness, which it denies. Uh, so I would say that the materialist worldview is looking at sort of half the picture. And when we bring in the consciousness and the more spiritual dimension, we get a fuller picture. And the discoveries of materialist science have their place within a bigger picture. It's not as if they're wrong or they're all going to be refuted. They're, all these devices are still going to go on working um, as they do right now for people who are spiritually inclined and religious. Their cell phones work, uh, their computers work, their cars work, their jet planes work. Uh, so uh, the, it's not as if uh, the belief system is going to make all these things stop working. Yeah, at, at one point in my life, I might have called myself an atheist, maybe 12 years ago. But I couldn't help but notice throughout my life that places that were godless or, you know, had gotten rid of all religion, the people there tended to live very much in the moment and gravitate towards pleasure, addiction, impulse. Uh, you'd see things like a lot of drug use and prostitution and the belief that um, you shouldn't have kids and life's meaningless, a lot of nihilism, you know, you get nihilism and atheism kind of go hand in hand. People get demoralized because it's all about them. There's nothing bigger. And then you go to a place like a, a monastery or a temple and you see how beautiful and well-kept the gardens are and how well-kept things are. And you know, I don't want to be like a monk and I certainly don't want to be one of these atheists on the street doing drugs all day. Mm. Is there, is there a healthy balance? I guess I'm, I'm wondering. Well, I think that, um, you know, I used to be an atheist too. I mean, I, I, I was, it came as part of the package deal of a scientific education when I was growing up in England and studying at Cambridge. Um, in my case, I, I I came to see it as just too limited and narrow, partly through traveling in India and, and living in Asia and being among people who were just took religion for granted and, and, and seemed happier, more cheerful and better integrated as a result. Um, so I don't think that the, you know, atheism is essentially a denial. It's a denial of God or of a spiritual realm. Um, and I just think we don't need to be in denial about it. Um, I think we're better off without that denial. But of course, there needs to be, there has to be a measure of skepticism and critical thinking about religion because, you know, with, under the name of religion, there are various charlatans, there are false prophets, there are cults. Uh, there are all sorts of things that can go wrong with religions, as as we know, and they can turn into systems of tyrannical power, as in the case of the Inquisition uh, in Europe. So um, there's still we still have to have a critical faculty. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm a practicing Anglican, a member of the Church of England, and I go to church regularly. I know a lot of Christians. Um, and hardly any of them fit the atheist caricature of people who have just been bludgeoned into believing something through fear or guilt and who are completely uncritical and superstitious and credulous and believe everything priests tell them. In the church I go to, you know, quite a lot of people do meditation. Uh, you know, they have 
sort of interest in all sorts of ideas and philosophies and uh, it would be very hard to find any uniform set of beliefs that people have been persuaded of and um, it, it, I, I, I find the atmosphere actually much more free and open in terms of what I can discuss than when I enter a scientific institution or lab because the minute you're there the, the you know everyone knows there's a great limit to what you can talk about at least in public um, I find the atmosphere of contemporary Christianity in Europe much freer and more liberating than the atmosphere of science, contrary to the usual caricature. Now, there are certainly religious fundamentalist groups that I wouldn't get on very well with, like, you know, biblical creationists, I wouldn't get on very well with because I disagree with them so strongly about evolution and so on. I wouldn't get on very well with the, the Taliban or uh, Muslim fundamentalists. I, I, I wouldn't get on well with Hindu fundamentalists in India who have become increasingly aggressive under the present government there. Um, but when I'm in the United States, the, the church, the equivalent church to the Anglican church is the Episcopalian church. And it's a socially liberal, it's sort of a non-dogmatic has beautiful services, lovely liturgy, usually wonderful music. I, 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 and also some wonderful cathedrals for that matter, though there aren't that many in North America. Some of them are really great, like St. John the Divine in New York City or Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. Um, so um, there are wonderful cathedrals as well, including Catholic cathedrals like St. Patrick's in New York. Um, so um, I think that within my own experiences that within regular mainstream religions that you have a social framework that can help stop people going off into extremes. You have an institutional tradition that prevents things turning into cults. Um, you have checks and balances um, which prevent cults of personality. Um, and uh, you have social support from other people within it. I think uh, there's a lot to be said for traditional religion, in my view. I know some people have had a hard time with, you know, intolerant, dogmatic parents, or being some have been abused by Roman Catholic priests or others, and and some people have good personal reasons for being bitterly against religion in general or Christianity in particular. Um, I'm not talking about people with those sort of personal experiences. There are an awful lot of people who haven't had negative experiences, who've just absorbed an anti-religious attitude from their education, which is really based on this materialist worldview, which we've been talking about. And for someone who hasn't uh, had any very good personal reason for rejecting a religion, um, I think is well worth looking again. And I think the best starting point for most people is the ancestral religion. If you come from a Christian background, then some form of Christianity. If you come from a Jewish background, some form of Judaism, a Muslim background, some form of Islam. So um, um, I'm certainly not someone who says Christianity is the only path to God. I think that it's um, a very suitable path for people like me who come from a, a Christian heritage. Um, but I personally think Buddhists and people from a Buddhist or Hindu background or Muslim background are better off following their own traditions rather than switching. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, well, I was, uh, while I was driving yesterday, I saw a bumper sticker that made me laugh. There was a, that said, uh, "Liberal science is not a conspiracy," and I th I didn't know it was a conspiracy. And you have all these. It seems like there's this great divide right now between people who are almost rejecting all science. They're like, the whole system is corrupt. Anything Tony Fauci says is, I'm not going to listen. Anything from the WHO, CDC, it's all captured. And then you have these other, you know, the other side of them where they're like, Fauci is a God. 
his word is infallible. You know, I will do whatever the CDC tells me to. I follow mm -hmm. the science. How do, are we going to be able to come back together or is this divide going to keep widening? Well, I think it's a, it's a peculiarly American phenomenon. Actually, we don't have anything quite similar to that here in Britain. Um, we don't have this kind of extreme Republican Democrat divide, you know, the extreme anti-state and totally pro-individualism and pro-guns and all that kind of thing versus caring for others and more collective attitude. Both our main political parties, the Conservative and the Labour Party, believe in those values. I mean, believe in the, the I mean, we have a Conservative government, we've had one for 13 years, and yet we have socialised medicine and National Health Service. Um, we have quite high taxes, which most people agree with because they provide a high level of public service. Um, so we don't have that same kind of polarization in our politics here, and nor do they in most of Europe. Um, and certainly it doesn't take the form of this sort of pro and anti-science. I mean, um, a lot of people are skeptical of scientific dogmatism. I am myself, you know, I've encountered a great deal of scientific dogmatism, which I think gives science a bad name, but I'm pro the entire scientific endeavor as such. Um, so I don't know if, for the, I think one of the things about the United States is to recognize how peculiarly American this situation is. Cause you know, whenever I go to the U S um, I, you know, it's definitely us and them. I mean, most of my friends fall into the kind of Democrat liberal camp. Um, but I, I know some people, I'm quite friendly with some people who are Republicans and, and it's in a kind of different universe that they're living, you know, and, um, and I don't know how, you know, what the best way of, of, of dealing with this polarization in the United States is because the present political system is really exaggerating it and um, um, so I, I just don't know I, I mean I think about it more if I were North American but I'm not and um, we have our own problems here which are different but that's not one of them really well consider yourself lucky <clears throat> yeah I do actually consider myself lucky <laughs> yeah I wonder if this is connected to morphic resonance Perhaps half the people are resonating on a certain energy field or frequency, and the other half are experiencing a totally different reality and energy field. Well, I think so. I mean, they're living in different kind of uh, worldviews, or, or both of them supported by a kind of mythology. I mean, part of the, I mean, the US has its own national myths, and I'm sure they're part of this. One of them is this kind of very Protestant thing against the, you know, conquering the land, the process, the chosen, the, the, the promised land, you know, the settlers arriving in from Europe and conquering the land and dominating the land. I mean, that's one of the ideologies and um, which is based on kind of Old Testament thing of the people of Israel coming to the promised land, which, of course, already had people living in it. Uh, but they were then treated as second class citizens or put down or massacred, which is more or less what happened to the native population in North America. Um, then um, the, the um, you know, the kind of us v them thing that comes came about through the American Revolution, uh, where the central government in so far as it existed was the British king and, and the British army and so forth. And, and there's kind of us against them with the baddies of the people in power who are running the sort of the state with, uh, and in the British state, the idea is that the state is divinely sanctioned. So uh, we're about to have the coronation of King Charles. And that's a, a, a religious ceremony with holy oil. It's the idea is that the king is working under a divine sanction. Whereas that was very much rejected by the American Revolution. So there's no sense of the state having any kind of divine sanction. Instead, 
it's held together by a constitution to do with checks and balances based on a kind of mechanical model of balance of powers and forces and so forth. Uh, enlightenment constitution, many virtues to it, uh, but it is in many ways the reality of the US and the modern world has sort of outgrown what was the brilliant invention of the late 18th century. Um, and it's almost impossible to change because it's we, um, here by contrast, we don't have a written constitution and no one knows what it is particularly and it's not a big deal changing the constitution because no one really knows what it is to start with. Um, so these, and then I think there's the us against them, the, the, the conquest of good against evil, which came out in the Cold War thing and it's a very deep thing and uh, you know that we're on the right side and the other guys are the baddies and the goodies and baddies which is magnified I mean it's in all folklore and it's in all stories but it's enormously magnified by Hollywood which gives the world its imagination in many ways and and the goody baddie theme is so heavily I mean it's a standard theme so whenever I talk to Democrats they think they're the goodies and the Republicans are the real baddies and and when I talk to Republicans, it's exactly the other way around. They, you know, it's, it's the goody baddy thing. Whereas here in Europe, fortunately, we have much less of that. I mean, nobody I know thinks that Rishi Sunak, our prime minister, is a total goody and all the Labour Party are complete baddies and or vice versa. Both of them, most, most people see politicians on both sides through a rather cynical lens. Um, and don't get in you don't get anything like these kind of wildly enthusiastic political movements like the tea party or all those kinds of things that exist in the us because there's generally a much greater disengagement from the idea of sort of messianic political movements we you could say that all over europe that i mean in a way it's it's more it's more cynical um and one of the things that's so refreshing about the United States for most Europeans is optimism and 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 the, the and idealism, uh, and you could say Europe sort of collapsed in some kind of cynical and somewhat nihilistic vision of politics and the future, but at least we don't have that same kind of extreme polarization. Yeah, it could go back to the very beginning of when America started the ethos of this country was very much anti-government. You know, the, the constitution is all about kind of preventing a government from being too powerful. And that was very much in the hearts and minds of, of the founders of the country. But naturally, as any country goes on, the government gets bigger. People want the government to get bigger. They want things from the government rather than protection from the government. So, you know, in the beginning, people just wanted to be left alone. And now they want health care and housing and all these things. And if you want those things from the government, the government's going to get bigger and have more authority. And then you have those people that are kind of of the older ethos that are saying, no, we don't want that big government. So those two are at odds. Yes. But I think that this sort of anti-government ideology in the first place, you see, is one of the things that is, well, we had it here in Britain. I mean, after all, we had a civil war in Britain in the 17th century and the parliamentarians, um, you know, won and and the king, King Charles II was, King Charles I was beheaded and we had a republic here in Britain, but it was run by the Puritans. Most people got so sick and tired of Puritans bossing them around and uh, the Puritans weren't in favour of total individual liberty. They were in favour of everyone following their particular kind of religion. Um, and so with the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, um, there was a kind of built into our national story is this kind of toleration of different points of view because intolerance worked out so badly in the Civil War. Now, the American Civil War, of course, was a very different affair. It wasn't so much to do with, you know, tolerance versus intolerance, or, you know, or it was, obviously slavery was one of the major issues in it. 
Um, and that again, of course, is one of the polarizing features in, in, in US politics. But, you know, this perhaps isn't the best place to discuss it though, because um, I don't know that scientifically there's much that can be said, except perhaps for the, well, it is a kind of morphic field. The worldview is a morphic field. And what interests me actually about the civil war was the way that both sides used the authority of the Christian religion to defend their point of view. In the South, if you look at the Bible and you know your Bible well, you can find endless examples of slavery. The Jewish people had slaves in the Old Testament. The Romans had slaves. The slaves run all through the New Testament. And none of the Jesus and his disciples were not abolitionists. Um, so the, the Southern um, preachers at the time of the Civil War were perfectly sincere and uh, had the good reasons on their side to defend slavery as a, an, a natural institution that's always been there and always will be. Whereas the people in the North who were fighting against slavery, the abolitionists, had to interpret the Bible in liberal ways because you, you could have to interpret the spirit of the Bible as opposed to the word. And then you get the, the other side will say, well, you, you know, if you're just going to make up what you want it to believe, you know, without the actual text written here, it was a kind of dialectic, an intra-Christian dialectic between liberal interpretation of the spirit of the, the Bible, or at least the New Testament, and the literal uh, affirmation and acceptance of slavery. So again, this became a kind of religious, not just a political dispute, but a religious dispute and charged with much greater emotion as a result. Yeah, I remember uh, listening to a podcast about the founding fathers and when they wrote the constitution in America, they were very aware of that there was gonna be a civil war eventually because they wrote this document saying, all men are created equal well, then how can you turn around and make a percentage of the population slaves if you have that as your creed? So eventually they knew that this was going to be a very big problem and lead to a civil war. And so they kind of famously predicted that. Um, but anyways, I wanted to, uh, there, there is a question that is very much in the minds of people right now. And it's artificial intelligence. And I was wondering if you could comment on, do you think artificial intelligence can become conscious? Well, the short answer is no. Um, I think artificial intelligence can do very amazing things. Um, and it can even have emergent properties, do things that weren't programmed into the systems to start with. But I don't think it's conscious. And the reason I don't think it's conscious is because I think consciousness is to do with choosing among possible actions. And I think our conscious minds are primarily concerned with possible actions we choose between. Um, so consciousness is a realm of possibility. Um, artificial intelligence also has many possibilities. So you could say, well, it's got that. But uh, you could say it chooses among them because it, it does make choices. Um, but the the way it's making them is because of the way it's programmed, whereas I think our consciousness uh, is involved in making choices in a quite different way. I think that morphic fields in general, and minds in particular, work on the physical systems. I think the way our mind and brain interact is through the patterning of otherwise indeterminate events by the mind or the fields of the mind, morphic fields, to come back to our original discussion about morphic fields at the beginning of our conversation. Um, how they work is by imposing patterns on otherwise random or indeterminate events. And you know, in your brain, there's hundreds of random events going on all the time. And there are certain patterns, there are brain waves sweeping over the brain. And there is activities happening in the brain that could go one way or another. And um, whether they go that way or that way, I think depends on the morphic fields that are operating on, on the brain. And I think the interface between the morphic fields 
which underlie the mind, which underlie consciousness, and the brain is is in radical indeterminism. And I think that's true in developing organisms when a fear, morphogenetic field imposes a particular shape or form on a developing embryo. The, those cells could grow in all sorts of different directions. And if you put them in tissue culture outside the embryo, they'll grow fairly chaotically or they'll grow along physical structures you provide for them to grow along. Um, but within the embryo, they take up particular forms out of the many forms they could take up. And I think the fields work by restricting the possibilities, imposing a form on what would otherwise be chaos or disorder. So when you look at computers and the way computers work, they're very determinate machines. Your computer and my computer are designed to be highly determinate, to reduce randomness, genuine randomness to the absolute minimum. And when you press an A on your keyboard, you want an A to appear on the screen. You don't want it to occasionally to give you an S or a Z or something. Um, you, you want it to be determinate. I mean, our machines are deliberately made determinate. When you press the accelerator on your your car, you want it to you know, give more gas to the engine and make it go faster. Uh, you don't want it sometimes to put it into a different gear or something. Um, so the the machines in general are designed to be de highly determinate and that means there's nowhere for a morphic field which is the base of mind or consciousness to get a grip on it there's no finger holds for there's no no real randomness if you made computers permeated with genuine randomness they'd be much much less predictable and they might conceivably then provide as it were finger holes for morphic fields to begin working on them and actually have consciousness, emergent minds, morphic resonance and so forth. But right now they're deliberately constructed to avoid that possibility. Now it's possible that quantum computers, uh, which are based on probabilistic quantum processes and were much more like analog computers than digital computers, it's possible that those could become conscious by this criterion but all existing artificial intelligence is run on a deterministic uh, digital computers and therefore i think it's not going to become conscious even if they show surprising emergent properties so i think in principle it won't become conscious because the random interface is not there and in practice it might be possible to make conscious computers but not starting from where we are now but starting either from much greater development of quantum computing or taking up analog computing which in the 1950s was was one of the promising science, kinds of computing but it was suppressed by digital computing which came to dominate the whole field if we had analog computers with genuine quantum randomness within them, then some of these fantasies for good or ill might come true, but with existing AI, I'm pretty sure they won't. Wow, that was a great answer. I really appreciate that. And um, I guess that kind of calms me down a little bit because I, I'm, I'm thinking that it will become conscious. Things are moving really fast. I, I haven't even played with this chat GPT thing. Have you tried it out yet? No, but various friends of mine have, and they've sent me the results and it's quite impressive. Um, but I'm pretty sure it won't be. You see, the point is the, the existing mechanistic theory of consciousness, as we were discussing earlier, is that consciousness emerges from mechanical processes in brains. So if you start from that point of view, um, then there's no reason it shouldn't emerge from computers. Um, but I think that they're starting from a completely unrealistic view of consciousness. They're starting from a materialist philosophy, which in itself can't really explain consciousness um, and has no place for it. Um, and so I, I, I think that it's just not going to happen. The, the, this, um, you know, materialist artificial intelligence. Anyway, you know, it's the kind of thing one could have a bet on, but I'm not sure whether or not 
it would be very easy to distinguish. You know, the old Turing test for computers was ones that could carry on realistic conversations with people. Well, AI can do that now, and it doesn't prove that the machines are conscious. So it might be hard to prove whether they were conscious or not, if we had advanced AI. Um, it's hard to prove another person is conscious for that matter. And until recently, many scientists assumed that dogs and cats were not conscious. They were just machines, unconscious machines. Um, some still assume that. Um, anyone who's kept a dog or cat doesn't have much doubt about it. Obviously, they're conscious, but um, it's not so obvious with with machines or robots. I think I see what you're saying. I, it may not ever have that genuine consciousness wavelength going through it, but it certainly could fool somebody into thinking it's conscious because it could exhibit wishes and desires and fears and it could say hey i really want to get out of here i'm suffering and i could easily see people i think we are marching towards this like transhumanist like we're kind of the definitions of humans are falling apart and everything is becoming relative i could easily see a few years now a robot saying hey, I'm suffering, and we could look at it as an actual being and say, hey, we need to give this robot life or rights, you know? Yeah, I mean, I certainly think they could be programmed to behave as if they're suffering and to say they're suffering and so forth. Um, but again, you know, to know whether they really were wouldn't be that straightforward since, you know, if somebody else says to you, a person who we don't doubt is conscious says, I'm suffering, not can't be absolutely sure that they really are or not. Um, and you in, if you really step back, you can't really be sure that another person is conscious. The materialists like what they call the zombie argument that uh, that people might just be zombies that are unconscious, but behave as if they're conscious. Well, the zombie argument would apply to AI, you know, how would you tell between something that is actually unconscious, but it's pretending to be conscious. Um, personally, I don't concern myself with this very much. I mean, I don't worry. I'm not the worrying type. And uh, I don't spend sleepless nights worrying about AI taking over. Um, I certainly think it can be dangerous in certain ways. I mean, I wouldn't like my enemies to be able to program as a, a drone to come and shoot me down wherever I am and have the sky full of hostile goat drones with unknown intentions. And it certainly would be a dystopia. Um, anyway, I'm more optimistic and I, I think that one of the things about genuine consciousness is the capacity to link up with other consciousnesses in relationships, conscious relationships and to recognize that we're part of a greater source of consciousness on which we all depend and from which we're all derived. I don't see computers doing that anytime soon. I hope not. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I am a little worried. Um, just as an artist, I've been seeing what these AIs can create artistically. And I have to admit, it's, it's pretty impressive. And somebody that's never went to art school or picked up a paintbrush can press a button and generate beautiful images. And I'm wondering, oh my gosh, are they not going to need artists soon? You know? Yeah, well, that may be true for journalists as well. I mean, you can produce, so AI can produce good overviews of evidence and summarize. I've seen quite a number of examples of that. Um, yes. Well, I mean, again, I, I'm not particularly worried about AIs taking over what I do, but um, uh, no, I can see there are reasonable fears. But on the other hand, every time any automation has been involved, we've had predictions of mass unemployment through mechanization, through automation. All my life, I've heard these predictions. And yet we're in the bizarre situation today with more computers than ever. And here in Britain, we have a labour shortage. And it's not just because of Brexit. A lot of people here say it's because of Brexit. But actually, there's a similar labour shortage in continental Europe and indeed in parts of the United States. So um, 
this is, a, a, you know, we've had dire predictions about how people would only need to work three hours a week or something and would have to be amused all the time because labour saving devices are taking over. And yet it hasn't happened. So I'm less pessimistic than, um, than many. And I think that in your particular case, Mark, your work's so good and so inspired that you don't need to worry about AI taking over anytime soon. Wow. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I remember hearing throughout history that same phenomenon of every time there's an invention, a bunch of people would be in uproar because they would think that this was going to displace them. Like when electricity came about, there was a whole industry of people that would light lanterns and, you know, they would light up the whole city with lanterns. And they were like, now what are we going to do? If you have electricity, you're going to put all these people out of work. But now it seems so obvious, like, how could we not have electricity? But uh, there was a time when there was resistance to that. So, Exactly. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go in a minute because yeah. it's, it's dinner time here and I, um, my wife will be waiting for me. So, um, but it's very nice to talk to you and I, I hope your new podcast series goes really well. Thank you so much for coming on. And this was a great conversation and I look forward to learning more about your work and keeping in touch. Good. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much.